Well, Don, uh, thank you, and Bishop McDonald. I mean, uh, I appreciate uh, being here. Monday is World Health Association Suicide Prevention Day. Isn't that interesting? Well, you can see I, I'm here. Um, I'm a doctor of radiation oncology. I've been at the medical school for a long time, probably taking care of about 10,000 patients. Um, when, we pa when Oregonians passed the assisted suicide law, the medical school in Oregon, and we only had one medical school at that time, convened a meeting for the faculty, and they basically said, we're a state institution, we're gonna do be doing this. And my thought was, I'm not. Others felt the same way, and a few of us formed an organization called Physicians for Compassionate Care Education Foundation, with, and we have sponsored conferences, palliative care conferences, conferences to help doctors and others take care, learn how to take care of pain. We've also tried to educate ourselves about assisted suicide. One of your famous, uh, um, if you don't know of him, he's not famous, I guess. <laughs> but one person that should be famous is Francis Peabody, who was a very prominent doctor at Harvard in 1927. And uh, he was very beloved and honored. Uh, and in an address that was in the Journal of the American Medical Association in 1927, he concluded by the statement, the secret of the care of the patient is in caring for the patient. The legalization of assisted suicide has turned medicine upside down. Um, we currently have, we, patients sh should be in a safe haven, a safe harbor when they're with their doctor, but when the doctor can write a prescription to kill them, they're, not, they're no longer in that safe haven or that safe harbor. You don't care for a person by killing them. When I was 15, my father was a, a faculty member at a, a state college, and he said, and there's a lot of politics involved in what was going on at the time in his life. And he said, Ken, go into medicine so you don't have to worry about politics or the government. <laughs> so I went into politics so I could talk to Catholic priests <laughs> and others and the bishop. Um, I've seen many medical advances in my life. When I uh, came out of medical school and was in my residency, a handheld calculator did not even exist. We did our calculations with a slide rule. We had no CAT scans, no MRIs, there was very little chemotherapy. Uh, we've had so many new medicines. So we've had many advances in medicine, but we've also had um, the political effect of medicine. We've had or, uh, assist, assisted suicide in Oregon since 1998. It's important to understand the definitions, and this is the definitions from the American Medical Association, that physician-assisted suicide is that when the physician facilitates a patient's death by providing the necessary means and or information to enable the patient to perform the life-ending act. Provide sleeping pills and information about the lethal dose while aware that the patient may commit suicide. No, these are sleeping pills. We don't, uh, those who are writing the prescriptions are not writing prescriptions for morphine or op opioids. They're writing sleeping pills. And sometimes those sleeping pills are hard to find. They're secanol, pentobarbital, which are not, we don't use those. I mean, the only, if, you, if a person, uh, I don't know if, if anybody in Massachusetts is ever writing prescriptions for secanol or pentobarbital anymore. They're, they're not. They're only being used for assisted suicide. Morphine's not being used. And the American Medical, Associ Medical Association's Code of Ethics says that allowing physicians to participate in assisted suicide would cause more harm than good. Physician-assisted suicide is fundamentally incompatible with a physician's role as a healer. It would be difficult or impossible to control and would pose, society, pose serious societal risks. I was interviewed by a reporter, uh, who, or a writer, who actually had an article published in the uh, New Yorker magazine, and her only quotation from me was this, that uh, I did not go into medicine to kill people. I didn't. <laughs> we, we don't, when we interviewed prospective medical students, that's not a question that we ask or, or consider. Um, for 2,400 years, uh, physicians have withstood the allure of promoting death. We've cared for the weak and outcasts when others have turned away. Sort of the example of the Good Samaritan. Uh, today's pressures include economic ones, such as forces may compromise patient care and, com and promote assisted suicide. Physicians have the duty to safeguard human life, especially life of the most vulnerable, the sick, elderly, disabled, poor, ethnic minorities, and those whom society may consider unproductive or burdensome. When a person, again, Mondays, 
you should remind people on Sunday in your parishes that tomorrow is Suicide Prevention Day <laughs> in the world. When a person expresses a desire to take their own life, society acts to protect that person from committing suicide. However, when assisted suicide is legalized, then society acts to assist that person in committing suicide. They really, it's a facilitation of suicide. This is especially true for those who are seriously ill or have disabilities. They have lost society. People say they want this choice, but what they need to realize is they're lo they are losing a protection against their potentially having, uh, dying from suicide. I think we can learn a lot from political cartoons, and this was in 1999, and the sign says, welcome to Oregon, may we assist you in your suicide, and the people in the car, or at least one of the person said, I think that sign might make people feel too unwelcome. Then, um, the focus of assisted suicide legalization, the people that are coming into your state, is primarily compassion and choices and others associated with them. Uh, their focus is to give doctors a legal right to legal protection and the right to kill patients. They're not coming in saying, we, are, we will improve your comfort care. They're not coming in and saying, we will improve your pain management. They're not saying, we will improve your palliative care. That's not why they're here. Their focus is to legalize assisted suicide. The legalization of assisted suicide does not give any new rights to patients. Its purpose is to legally protect doctors who write prescriptions for lethal drugs. As there's an immunity section in these laws that protects doctors. The legalization of assisted suicide takes away from the terminally ill and disabled patients the protection against doctors who order their death by a prescription for lethal drugs. The legalization in Oregon was not the result of a scientific medical advance. It was the result of campaigning by the Hemlock Society that later became the Compassion and Choices organization and they're leading the campaign here. They use a lot of euphemisms. They don't like to use the phrase assisted suicide. They want to use other, uh, other words. In his book, uh, in his 1993 book, it was titled uh, Lawful Exit, it's just a little paperback. Derek Humphrey, who's the founder of the Hemlock Society, devoted an entire chapter titled Double Speak. This is a book the purpose of the book is that this is how we get assisted suicide laws passed. It's called lawful exit. And the proponents of assisted suicide use euphemisms in their campaign to legalize assisted suicide, but suicide is still uh, suicide. Peter Admiral, in a statement in American Medical News in 1997, um, stated, and he was a, uh, he's a euthanasia doctor from the Netherlands, he said, you will never get accustomed to killing somebody Writing a prescription is like giving a patient a loaded gun and just asking them not to shoot before you leave the house. So, Bishop McDonald, you're right on with that. About, you know, why not just give them a gun? Assisted suicide and euthanasia leads to a dumbing down of medicine. It requires no skill for a doctor to get out a prescription pad and say, Secanol, 100 milligram capsule, 100, take all at once. There's no skill involved with that. The reference for this uh, particular patient is at the bottom. This was a, a five-page article. It was in the American Journal of Psychiatry, published in uh, 2005. It's about Michael Reardon. In the article, he's referred to as patient A, but we know that he was Michael Reardon. And he was a 63-year-old lung cancer patient who had received lethal drugs without a psychiatric evaluation, even though he had previously had uh, psychiatric attempts uh, before he got the cancer diagnosis. Um, he had a number of people involved in his care, and uh, it was not his regular doctor that wrote the prescription for assisted suicide. It was one of the Compassionate Choices doctors. And his regular doctor, at one point, um, realized that he was suicidal and homicidal. So he committed him involuntarily to a psychiatric unit. He still had the lethal medicines at home. The social worker went to his home to find out what the conditions were, found that he, uh, it, it, was, uh, it was like a war zone in a sense because uh, 
uh, he, the social worker had the police go in and uh, the police removed 32 firearms and thousands of rounds of ammunition from this man's home. They didn't take his barbiturates. At the time of the hospital discharge, a palliative care consultant wrote that Mr. Freeland probably needed to, at attendant care, he needed to have a nurse or somebody else at home, but they didn't do that because it was a moot point, because he already had the means to take his life. You see how this is a dumbing down of medicine and how when you have this, op this option, uh, it really inhibits medical progress. Well, what does terminal diagnosis mean? Um, life expectancy is difficult to predict. Um, and again, another, at least to me, well-known doctor, but you don't need to know about him. <laughs> Dr. Dunphy, Dr. J. Engelbert Dunphy, gave a presentation at the annual meeting of the Massachusetts Medical Society in 1976 called On Caring for the Patient with Cancer. And it was actually published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And in it, he actually quotes the dictum of uh, uh, Francis Peabody about you know the, the secret of caring, uh, the secret of the care of the patient is caring for the patient. But in this article, he says, "My personal experience made it obvious to me that one cannot predict the precise course or outcome of cancer. The adage he will be dead in six months is an unforgivable statement for a physician to make." I have a friend who told me this story. I'll try to do it real quick. Uh, he was having some abdominal pain. They did a CAT scan. They found that he had some abnormalities in his liver, showed that there were abnormalities in the lower part of his lung. Uh, they did further scans, a uh, CAT scan of the, of the chest as well as the belly. They did a PET scan. It showed that he had about 70, 70, it's like seven zero tumors in his lungs, had over 20 tumors in his liver. Uh, he was told that the PET scan lighted up like a Christmas tree. Uh, they did a biopsy and it was advanced uh, adenocarcinoma of the liver. Uh, his doctor said, uh, you only have a month and a half to live. With this, all this information, um, he and his wife started clearing out the house of all of his belongings. He, he says, I probably gave away $20,000 of my things, my books, and my tools, maybe 10 cents on the dollar uh, for the things that I had. Uh, made arrangements for burial, uh, got ready to sell the house. And then he thought, um, just a minute here, I, I don't feel sick. They're telling me I'm going to die in a month and a half, and I don't feel sick. He went back to the doctors and said, I don't understand. You told me I'm going to die in a month and a half. I don't feel sick. I need more information. We need to get more information. So they did more biopsies, and they uh, sent the tissue to about seven different pathologists, and they found out that it was a condition kind of a long name, epithelioid hemangioendothelioma. It's kind of a long name. Um, very unusual. I had seen it before. Um, and um, that was eight years ago. He has never received any chemotherapy, no radiation, no treatment at all. He's working. His doctors nearly scared him to death. Um, if he had, you know, he was told how terribly it was that he was going to die. And I don't want that. That was eight years ago. Hey. Jeanette Hall is a patient of mine. This is, my, this is one of my stories. In the year 2000, she was diagnosed with cancer. It actually cancer of the anal canal, same, cancer, same type of cancer that killed Farrah Fawcett a while ago. And um, she was referred to me by the colorectal surgeon, and I told her that I thought there was a very good chance of curing her with chemotherapy and radiation. And she said, Dr. Stevens, you don't understand. I don't, want, I don't want to go through all that treatment. I want the pills. Three years ago, I voted for it. This is what I want. I want my choice. I said, well, Mrs. Hall, we can cure you of this. Uh, she then went back, to, uh, she went, then went back to the surgeon who was, had referred her to me. And when he realized that she, didn't, she wouldn't accept treatment, he said, well, Mrs. Hall, within six months or, or within six to 12 months, you're not going to be alive if you don't get treatment. And she came back. We, I, I actually, I didn't twist her arm, but I, I said, would you keep meeting with me? And we talk about this. And it took about four visits on a, a, every week. And I finally asked her more about her family. And she told me she had a son that was in the military, or not, the, uh, she was in, he was in the police academy. 
I said, wouldn't you like to see him graduate? And she, and she started seeing that there was reason to live. So uh, she agreed to treatment. The cancer melted away. She never did, have, did, she never did require any surgery because the chemotherapy and the radiation took care of it, as I told her it would. She's so grateful. In fact, five years later, she, uh, we lived in the sort of same area of Portland, and she saw me in a restaurant, and she came over to me and said, Dr. Stevens, you saved my life. If I had gone to an assisted care doctor, I would have gotten what I wanted, and I wouldn't be alive now. Uh, her, after that diagnosis, her mother developed uh, dementia. She was there to take care of her mother. If she had died, she would not have been there to take care of her of her mother. You're, be, you're being told that you need this because of pain, uncontrollable pain. That, um, as you've been told, pain can be controlled. Uh, it's really a smoke screen. Uh, uncontrolled pain in the terminally ill rarely occurs. And in Oregon, only a small minority, a very small minority of patients die because of the issue of pain. But it's not pain that they're having. It's, it's a fear of pain. It's, uh, you know, we talk about people having a fear of pain. I think there's also the pain of fear that we have to also realize. The New York Task Force in 1994, uh, the Task Force on Life and Law, said that assisted suicide and euthanasia, no matter how carefully any guidelines are framed, will be practiced through the prism of social inequality and bias that characterizes the delivery of uh, services to all. Uh, segments of society, including healthcare. There are growing concerns about healthcare costs. The New England Journal of Medicine had this article, tackling rising healthcare costs in Massachusetts. This was just came out this last week. How, how's Massachusetts going to have, handle the rising healthcare costs? Um, this cost consciousness will not be diminished and may well be exacerbated by healthcare reform. If intolerable suffering were the reason for assisted suicide, then why don't we do it in India, in Africa? Why is it only in, uh, you know, they have intolerable suffering there. Why is it only promoted successfully in affluent uh, societies? I got into trouble a few years ago saying that this is not death with dignity, this is death with vanity. Uh, uh, people want to die pretty and handsome. Uh, they don't want to go through the dying process. The message that proponents of assisted suicide are given to the public and to patients is that doctors can do a better job of killing you than you, they can of taking care of your medical needs. They're, they're feeding on this fear. Your doctor's not going to be able to take care of you, therefore the doctor needs to write a prescription for you. And then patients worry that the doctor becomes the attorney, judge, jury, and executioner. Patients with disabilities fear assisted suicide. The disability rights advocates are appalled at the negative assisted suicide message directed to people with disabilities. Assisted suicide advocates devalue those who are disabled by playing on the, quote, horrors of dependency, that uh, there are some situations that are worse than death, like being in a wheelchair. Those with disabilities fear that they'll be the next targets of assisted suicide, and they formed organizations like uh, Not Dead Yet and the Disability Rights Education and Defense Funds. I was in a convention center um, basement parking area a year ago. I saw this sign. I gotta get a picture of that sign. <laughs> Dead end. Wh uh, wheelchair parking only. Disability parking only. Is disability a dead end? Uh, depression is the leading cause of suicide. Depression needs to be diagnosed and properly treated with counseling and medications. Oregon's re Oregon researchers reported in 2008 that 25% of those, this is from the Oregon Medical School the researchers, that 25% of Oregonians requesting assisted suicide were depressed. Yet in the past five years, there have been only four of 304 of those who died of assisted suicide who had a psychiatric evaluation. That's 1%. A depression is not being evaluated. Assisted suicide is cheap. You save money. There are financial reasons why HMOs, insurance companies, or the state medical programs may promote cheaper assisted suicide rather than have prolonged costs of caring for a patient with chronic disease. There's concern that vulnerable, pe vulnerable people with limited resources may feel that assisted suicide is their only 
choice. Derek Humphrey, in an article back in 1998 in the Oregonian newspaper, said that uh, economics makes sense for euthanasia, that it can help solve the rising uh, health care costs. You're told that it's choice, but choice is an illusion. Since the suicide is a recipe for elder abuse, as you were told, uh, one of the witnesses can be the heir. Uh, in Oregon, legalization has empowered the, state, the Oregon Health Plan to steer citizens to suicide, and other suicides have increased with the legalization of assisted suicide. So legalization will actually decrease patient choice. 